So first off, director, you grew up in Adams County, and every time I go to Adams County, there's some kind of interesting story that happens when I'm down there, because it's Adams County, right? So uh, could you just share a little bit about your background and, and let folks know about uh, you growing up and where you came from? Sure. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, yes, I am Brian Baldridge, the uh, new director of uh, Department of Agriculture on the job about 80 days. So um, grew up in Adams County, and uh, I a uh, number of things, but uh, and I'll touch on those, but as county commissioner, um, we would have a board meeting, and I was on the state board of directors, and I always said, the thing about Adams County, folks, we're number one. Everybody goes, well, no, we all are. And I said, no, alphabetically, we're number one. So I grew up and <laughs> grew up in Adams County, and uh, yeah, we were number one alphabetically. But uh, and seventh generation family farm. Um, at the age of five, we lived in Springfield, Ohio. Um, Dad was with Occidental Chemical Company, and they said they were closing their Springfield office. And at that point, the option was to go to Houston, Texas, and thank goodness we didn't. Mom and Dad went back home, bought the home place from Grandma and Grandpa, and uh, you know we were a very diverse uh, family farm. Uh, we corn, beans, uh, beef, cattle, hogs, uh, and I got to even say sheep, and that was accidental. It's what happens when you, uh, as a junior high student and you're in a general livestock judging contest back in the Wilmington uh, general livestock judging contest, if you were third high individual, you want to suffolk you. So we, we came home from that event and uh, got into sheep business. But uh, uh, also we were burly tobacco farmers, uh, way of life in southern Ohio and, and did that for a number of years. And the unique thing for, for not, uh, that's not normal to Southern Ohio is uh, we were a hybrid seed corn business. So we grew hybrid seed corn, still got a couple of tasslers out in the barn. Uh, we have not grown any for a few years, but uh, they, need to, they need to find a new home. Um, so yeah, it was a very diverse family farm. Um, the roots are strong. It was, it was a tremendous way of life growing up. And uh, it's been amazing to, to raise my two children uh, in that environment. And now I look forward to uh, letting my grandchildren enjoy that as well. So everybody, I think, in this room probably understands the value that comes along with growing up on a farm. What were some of your fondest memories, favorite parts about being on a farm, and maybe some of the least favorite parts, maybe the sheep? You might have already covered that. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll touch on the sheep, and from a standpoint, you know, one Suffolk you, you just can't have one. I think we're up to 20 for a while. So, yeah. But, no, it, you know, the things I, as, as later in life, and you look back on those, those events and, and just the, the foundation, growing up, the opportunities that, um, you know, th that livestock or, you know, 4-H, FFA, just that truly ag family base, um, you get to enjoy. And you, and you think back on that, and I think, you know, wow, um, those meant everything. Those were the foundation uh, in, in our lives, and, and, and hard work was part of that. Um, and that's, that's a tremendous positive. Um, the negatives, um, and it's, it's probably one of the reasons that I, uh, and I'll touch on that later, but did a career away from the farm as well. But I lived through mom and dad, uh, as many of us did, um, in the 80s, the early 80s. Um, high interest rates, uh, high input costs, and we had two back-to-back -back years of very little um, yield. And uh, watch mom and dad go through those tough financial times. And that's, you know, those cycles always work through the agricultural community. Um, you know, we prepare for those uh, the best we can, but it's always very stressful on families. So that, I remember seeing that, that stress as a, as a high school student um, that mom and dad went through through those tough times. And, you know, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's the negatives that you think about, but it also made us stronger. Now, you also spent a fair amount of time uh, serving as a first responder, I believe, on the volunteer fire department. And uh, being a volunteer firefighter in Adams County, it's got to be interesting. Uh, what, what skills did you learn through that that are helping you out today? So, yeah, I, uh, you know, it was one of those things in, in, in rural Ohio today, you know, first responders, it's kind of a tough issue. Um, there's there's uh, a lot of discussions uh, with the governor's office and trying to figure out what is the future to protect the safety services of rural Ohio. But for me, it was, you know, those were, this was the men and women in our community uh, who left their businesses, um, you know, left church, uh, got up in the middle of the night, um, who protected our, our small township was 1,700. It was a very small township, um, people. And, uh, you know, those were the folks I looked up to. And I said, that's, that's why I wanted to get on the volunteer fire department. I had no idea that that, uh, entering into that, um, figured out that I really, really enjoyed that. And uh, as I talked about wanting to diversify from the farm, um, I, uh, I took the next steps and ended up becoming a paramedic 
And uh, so I was a firefighter medic and uh, went down towards Cincinnati, uh, an hour commute. Um, but I was a fire medic for Anderson Township uh, for 25 years. Um, the neat thing about that is you work one day off two. Um, so you work two days a week and every third you work a third, third day. So, um, but it really gave me, you know, I could still farm. I could do all those things I wanted to. And uh, I didn't know that it was going to be a path into local government, uh, which, which ended up being uh, where we are today. So were there any transferable skills you learned in that that uh, you're going to use at the uh, Department of Agriculture? Uh, train, prepare for the worst, and uh, hope for the best. That's a good answer. <laughs> so now you've uh, been in the job uh, just a couple months now, and uh, any job is fun, and, and you certainly seem well suited to it. it seems like every time I see you, it seems like you're enjoying what you're doing. But there's uh, obviously going to be challenges with every job. What are some of your uh, least favorite parts of the job so far as you've gotten started? The, uh, probably the, the, the one that bothers me the most is I love to be very personal. And, and that usually means with a name when I meet somebody. And uh, you know, I, I walked into the Department of Ag and there's 450 employees. Faces, I'm all over it. Names, oh my goodness, I am struggling. So it's, it, it's the part for me, it's like, man. And I, and, I, and I look at those names and I study that because it's, as, as we have a tremendous team at the Department of Ag, I want to lift that up. And part of it's just knowing people on a personal basis and uh, respecting each other within a team. So I'm working on it. Not there yet, but I've got, got a few hundred to go. Now, uh, there's always going to be surprises that come up, some things unexpected, like, say, uh, national headline grabbing train wreck in Northeast Ohio, you may be familiar with. Uh, what are some of those challenges that you've already seen, and, and how have you been able to deal with those, including that one, but others as well? Sure. Um, and obviously, uh, day three on the job, um, of course, the catastrophic event with the wreck, uh, the train wreck. In That's a rough day three. Day three. I mean, at least they waited day three. So. But, uh, you know, as I looked at this, you know, it's kind of that, that first responder mentality kicked up a little bit. And I told our team as, you know, it was probably two or three days later. I mean, obviously, we knew that we were a secondary agency, but we knew that there would come a time where the Department of Agriculture would, would need to engage um, on this, this situation. You know, obviously, from a standpoint of uh, life and safety, life, um, property, that was number one. Um, but making sure that our agric agricultural community was heard and taken care of, we knew that was going to be secondary. So pretty early on, we, we started pulling together in the Department of Ag. Um, <clears throat> our folks that touched that area, anybody we could think of within the Department of Ag, which there's 19 departments, which I had to learn that as I went through the, the process of the position. But who, who in that area could be impacted? from uh, the, the train derailment. And uh, so we, we did a lot of preparation and, and preparing for that and knowing that it would come a time um, that we would engage. And that time did come. Uh, Governor DeWine reached out and said, okay, folks, um, you know, getting, we'd been in contact with our partners at, at the local level. Uh, I'm a huge uh, for the people, by the people at a local level. We've been in direct contact with our soil and water folks, um, our OSU extension, and our Farm Bureau folks. Obviously, those are the folks in the community. And uh, so we'd been in contact with them and uh, so prepared and, and had a meeting uh, in the agricultural community uh, on March 9th. Um, so it was about a month after the initial train derailment. But, uh, and went up and listened um, and, and really had good conversations. And without a doubt, what they wanted to come back, they, they believed that their product was safe, the product was healthy, and uh, they were feeling the pressures of the negative impact or the negative narrative that was hurting their markets. So the ask was to engage and to make sure that uh, we, were, we, were, we could test the products. We knew that the air had been tested. We knew that the water had been tested. Um, soil testing was ongoing. But we wanted to look at it and say, OK, you know, let's look at the forages. So we can say that our, our livestock, what they're intaking, uh, is safe. And, and we wanted to be able to come back and say, these markets are strong. There's no negative impact to the agricultural community. And uh, buy local. And so we did that. That's what we heard. Now, my answer at that meeting was, absolutely, we can do that. Well, that's easy for a director to do. And then the team went, we got to do what? And you started calling labs. And they're like, you want us to test for what? Yeah, we that's going to take us a while to set that up. So uh, we really appreciated the collaboration with Ohio State uh, University as we partnered up and uh, really came up with a plan to go through the process. Um, recently, 
We pulled those samples. Obviously, we wanted to wait until springtime growth was going. We pulled those samples in the, in the testing process currently. So, but yeah, that was, uh, that was by far the uh, day three was the, the biggest event, you know, from my standpoint. But it was, um, you know, it was something that uh, we feel confident that our job was to make sure that uh, the agricultural community had a strong uh, market that was not negatively impacted from a narrative um, that, that was very concerning. And I just want to dig a little bit deeper into that because you guys are looking at the reality of the situation, the tests, what is actually showing up in the environment and, and what actually happened on the farms. But you're having to deal with the perception that is based on whatever people are thinking in that area. Have, as this has unfolded, have you seen the perception and the reality get closer to the same or is it still, uh, still staying pretty far apart? I think it's gotten, the narrative has quieted way down. I mean, we were literally, um, through Dr. Summers, our state vet, and, and our team from that, we were, we were actually trying to track down Facebook posts of all these dead livestock and all these animals that, that supposedly were out there. Now, I think there was a confusing narrative within that creek and within very close proximity to the accident. There were a number of fish that died. Without a doubt, that was a, uh, you know, whether it was chemical, whether it was, um, you know, an oxygenation, oxygen, oxygen deficiency, whatever that was, those caused those death of those animals. But I think so many times in, with the media, with the narrative, with social media, that that was changing into 4,500 animals. I mean, and we ended up with 16 necropsies within our our animal diagnostic, uh, disease diagnostic lab uh, that our state vet and our team went through to make sure that we evaluated those carcasses. Um, part of them were wildlife, part of them were livestock. But we wanted to make sure we evaluated those carcasses and zero had uh, any concerns of chemical toxicity. So that was another narrative to push back on, on kind of what was being said. And, and it was hurting our markets, uh, hurting those local folks, especially those folks that had those one-on-one -on -one connections, um, you know, with with their sales, uh, direct sales up in that area. Another thing that I was really impressed with as that whole uh, incident unfolded is uh, there was a lot of panic, there was a lot of overreaction, but if you looked at the situation, the farmers kept doing their jobs. The livestock guys were still going in and taking care of their livestock, and people were preparing to plant and whatever else was needed to be happening on the farm. It was getting done, and you talked to some of those folks. Were you impressed by, by that effort? Absolutely, and didn't surprise me one bit because, you know, in an agricultural uh, mindset, um, folks, it might rain today, but sun's shining tomorrow and we've got to get to work. And, and, and that mindset was there. Uh, there was uh, work that needed to be done, and, and it was being done. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was great to talk to those folks. Now, I, I think it was, uh, you know, they needed to talk about it too, though. That was the issue because they were feeling that pressure from a narrative that they weren't feeling on their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, so it was uh, really, really good uh, to engage um, with them tremendously. So, and, and, I, and I'll add to the other thing, the other communication that we struck, uh, kicked off really early on was we started, you know, I, I kind of used a scenario. Um, in the agricultural community, there's a state line up there. But in the agricultural community, there is no state line. These are folks that the farms overlap, they're neighbors, um, and, and, and they're all part of the agricultural family. So we teamed up with Secretary um, from Pennsylvania, Secretary Redding, um, and, and early on we're having weekly calls and a couple times bi-weekly calls with the information and what we were doing here in Ohio, um, but also collaborating with our folks that were literally you know, within a few hundred feet uh, away from the train derailment just across the state, state line, which in this situation, yeah, scratch that line out because this is our agricultural community as a whole. Uh, another issue that's really top of mind uh, lately, I think, for a lot of folks in Ohio agriculture is the preservation of farmland. Uh, we've seen projects like Intel come in, which obviously have a lot of positives. Uh, there's uh, uh, work being done down in Fayette County as well with some major development there. Lots of houses, lots of warehouses. Some of these farm fields are going to be better at growing warehouses than they are being grow growing corn and soybeans. Uh, what's uh, on your radar in terms of this, this vital issue for, for Ohio agriculture? Sure. From a standpoint, you know, one of the things we're looking at at ag, this is the budgetary process. And, and I tell folks, um, you know, I was a township trustee, county commissioner, uh, and then recently served in the legislature. And I, I feel like as director of ag, I've testified more 
uh, in this short time than I did in the legislature, uh, which is really good because I get to tell the story, but one of the things we did was ask for more funding on farmland preservation. Um, this is an issue that the agricultural community is feeling the pressure. Uh, I carried legislation last General Assembly, and, and there was a clear message uh, when it came to solar, brownfields before cornfields. It's not about property rights. It's not about all these other discussions. It's about, let's put these panels, if you want to put the panels, and I'm fine with that, but let's put these on places. I've got, in my home county, we've got um, about over 1,000 acres, 500 acres of ash ponds, uh, over 1,000 acres of a footprint of two coal-fired power plants. What a great place to put solar panels. Um, so I, I think that narrative probably continues forward. I know that we stand behind its property rights, but you know, there's a lot of concerns when it comes to economic development um, and, and business because we want that. We have to have that. We know that drives our Ohio economy. Um, but, but we as the agricultural uh, community are feeling these pressures. So farmland preservation is going to continue to be more of a topic. Uh, I know as I went through the process uh, to fill this position, it was a priority for Governor DeWine. Um, he has a lot of concerns, as I think a lot of us do. Uh, the last I checked, we're not, uh, we're not producing any more uh, good, um, fertile farm ground here in Ohio. So we have to keep our eye on this. We have to make sure that we're having the right conversations. Um, believe wholeheartedly in property rights, but uh, we got to feed uh, America tomorrow. Uh, of course, one tool uh, for farmland preservation is the uh, easement program. And a ruling just came down yesterday in Union County on, uh, with regard to that, and it really defended that easement in, in a positive way in terms of farmland preservation. Uh, why is that so important going forward? So going forward, um, especially from the standpoint of protecting these easements, you know, I, I, I think if, if, I said this earlier, if we poll this room today, if there's an agricultural easement on that farm, what does that mean? And it probably means, yeah, it's agriculture, no other options. Well, when economic development comes along and gas lines come along and growth comes along, well, wait a minute, it's agricultural, but we can still do a lot of this, these other things. I think that's concerning to the agricultural community because it, to me it has to be, no, we're going to stand behind these easements and say, no, they were put in place by the landowners. We talk about property rights. They were put in place by the landowners and with a specific purpose, and that is to make sure that it stays stays farm ground. So uh, as a director, I mean, it's a tough issue. Um, obviously, we get into, I don't want to offend how many attorneys in here, but we get into that debate over, you know, uh, law and, and the wording of the preservation. And then the other unique aspect of it is imminent, imminent domain. Um, and that's going to be debated uh, way past uh, into the wee hours for a long time to come. And one word that is often associated with those easements is perpetuity. And I think that's a really important word uh, as we think about the future of keeping these farms in production agriculture. Absolutely. Uh, so what other issues do you see emerging? There's uh, a number of other challenges facing the state. We uh, had the high path avian influenza last summer, uh, and it continues to be a, a concern. There's uh, uh, African swine fever, another concern. Uh, not in Ohio or the US yet, but definitely a concern. What other challenges are out there that are going to be on your radar? Well, the, you just hit on, uh, you know, our, our top priority, high path. You know, we know that we, uh, in Ohio, had a, a major outbreak. Um, over 3 million, 3.4 million birds were put down at one facility. Um, out of 45 million, do the math, that's pretty significant. Uh, we had a number of backyard cases um, last year as well, and, and backyard flocks, meaning those small numbers that uh, you or I or anybody might have in their backyards, but obviously, um, you know, those were cases as well. So we are, uh, with our state vet, with our team, uh, constantly preparing for that. Um, it's a huge, uh, you know, it's kind of, again, prepare, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We know it's coming. Uh, it's ramping up again. We know that uh, there's a couple of cases in, uh, across into Canada, right across from the uh, from Lake you know, in northern Ohio, um, and I think there's a couple in Pennsylvania. So it's it, it's coming. Um, I had a great opportunity uh, Monday of this week uh, to be up in Northwest Ohio, uh, stopped by Cooper Farms. And, and really had a long talk with uh, those folks and what they're doing on their biosecurity and their preparation as well. And, you know, those best practices that are being used on, on their large scale, I think are tremendous practices that 
the, the community, the agricultural community in those livestock sectors can use as well and learn from. Because I, prevention uh, and biosecurity and you name it, those are the best ways uh, to protect Ohio as we move ahead. Uh, whether it's in the uh, you know, fowl, uh, you know, the poultry industry or whether it's in the swine industry on those two topics that are forefront. Um, the, uh, the exciting, the, the another exciting thing coming on uh, with the Department of Agriculture, this was done before I got here, but uh, you know, we secured, the Department of Agriculture secured $72 million for a new ADDL lab, Animal uh, Disease Diagnostic Lab. A lot of our stakeholders uh, in the industry were tremendous proponents as the capital uh, projects uh, went through last General Assembly. Um, and uh, so it's, it, it's exciting to see that coming. About 70% of the tests go out of Ohio. Uh, I think I said this earlier, buy local. Uh, we're gonna build this lab and we're gonna make sure that we put the technology in place to our agricultural community, um, that our lab is on, on the cutting edge, our technology is cutting edge, and uh, we wanna bring that business uh, back to here in Ohio and keep it in Ohio uh, for Ohio producers. So we're excited about that. Uh, the technology side of it, I, I kinda use this scenario um, as I look, you know, not, now we can get on my charts and check our, our blood work and, uh, and see how bad my cholesterol really is. Uh, but we can get on that. That, that technology is at our fingertips. And, and as we look to having a brand new uh, lab, uh, a $72 million investment, um, we want to have that technology at our fingertips too for producers. So we're excited about that aspect of it as well. Um, in addition to some of those things you've already talked about, uh, you're working, of course, with the DeWine administration that have set out some pretty clear priorities, one of which is conservation in the H2 Ohio program. That's obviously going to be a focus uh, that you're going to be paying a lot of attention to here in the coming weeks and months. Uh, you want to give us an update on that? Sure. Um, one of the things for me, the H2 Ohio program, uh, it is, it's pretty neat. Um, from a standpoint of being, I was came to the legislature in 2019, and I was on finance committee, and on finance committee, I was on the subcommittee for agriculture. And uh, so that was the very beginning of Governor DeWine's initiative on H2 Ohio. And I thought, wow, you know, now that I'm into this role, I was at the beginning, and, and, and as we figured out how we were gonna fund this, and how we were going to implement this from the legislative standpoint, and now to be on the operational standpoint, and, and now to be in a position of looking at it, um, you know, four years since that initial funding was put in place. So it's a tremendous opportunity to really look at uh, how we're doing this. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, you know, up in 24 counties in Northwest Ohio. Uh, within this budgetary process, we're looking at uh, expanding throughout the state, uh, and also expanding into our rivers. Um, Ohio has a beautiful amount and a tremendous amount of water. Uh, I kind of tell this story. I was out and our kids were younger and we were camping and, and uh, I think we were in Utah or, or Colorado, somewhere out in there. We pulled up to a campground and uh, I noticed all these for sale signs along the road of these. They called them ranches. I called them farms because they were pretty small. But terminology, different parts of the state. But they were all for sale. And, and we're, this campground's along the river. And, and I started talking to somebody and I said, why are all these, I mean, it just every single one of those small ranches were for sale. And I said, why is that? And he said, they don't have any water. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, nah, they don't have any water. I said, the water's right there. The river is literally right here, a nice running river. I said, they can't touch that water. So it puts it in perspective what we have here in Ohio, and we have to take care of that. And the agricultural community, I love the concept of Base 2 Ohio because it's a proactive measure to incentivize best practices, to make sure that the agricultural community is putting in the ground what that plant needs to uptake. And there's not, you know, we don't continue to have runoff. So this is a great program and it incentivizes the agricultural community. It proves best practices, but it's never changing. You know, we're four years into this. And I've told our folks, um, don't be scared to change direction if we need to, um, to, to make it even better. And, and, and I've pushed the folks in, in that department to say, let's, let's go. It's on me, it's on my shoulders. If it doesn't work, I'll take that hit, but know that we need to be doing uh, the best because it matters. You know, as I look at that grandbaby at home, it matters uh, to her generation uh, that we take care of our water today. 
Uh, and one key part of the success and a source of some of the challenges with implementing the H2 Ohio program came with the soil, local soil and water conservation districts, and ODA has to work very closely with them, of course. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that relationship has been uh, really very successful with the first initial rollout of the H2 Ohio program? Yeah, it, and touched on this earlier as far as local partners. Uh, this project is successful because of local, local partners and the work that is done um, with our, our soil and water conservation um, districts and so forth. Without a doubt, it's, it's the way it's made it a success. Um, we need to continue to tell the success story. Um, no matter if it is H2O higher or agriculture in general, we have a tremendous story to tell and we have to continue to tell it, but especially in this H2O Ohio, because there's folks that are continually pointing, pushing back, um, against the agricultural community and saying it's our fault. Uh, I was uh, on the County Commissioner's Board of Directors um, and it's probably 2014, 2013. And we had a board meeting and had a County Commissioner from an urban area in the state um, and he was pointing the finger to the agricultural community. He said, this is all the agricultural community's fault. All, all This is all your problem. And uh, I said, no, I got to push back. And I said, we're part of it. We as society are all part of this. Um, but it's, it's that personal septic system. Uh, it's that municipality septic system. I said, but the problem is we're out there with the fertilizer buggies. We're out there with our manure spreaders. We're out there with incorporating manure into soils. So we're front and center. They see us out there in the agricultural community. But this is a societal issue. Uh, it's easy for me to push back to that group and say, no, it's everybody. And we're in this together. And uh, we gotta, gotta keep this water clean and safe. Uh, what are some other DeWine administration priorities that you're going to be looking at here in, as you move forward? The, uh, the, the next, uh, the priority that uh, is clear is the vision for the state fairgrounds. Um, that's near and dear to my heart. Virgil, thanks for all your work out there. You do a tremendous job at the state fairgrounds. Um, I, uh, some of you might know the fairgrounds, but I've slept under the viaduct. I've slept in the pig barn. I've even spent a, a fair in the Ohio State Fair Youth Choir, or a, yeah, in the Ohio State Fair That's Youth Choir. That's high living for an Adams County guy, right? I'm telling you. <laughs> Folks have asked me to sing, and I said, there's not enough WD-40 to loosen these pipes back up. I've retired out of that. But uh, yeah, so I, now I was the only youngster in the State Fair uh, Youth Choir that got two days off to go show pigs. Everybody's like, how did you manage that? Because by that time, you're getting tired of being day in and day out doing the same thing. But uh, so for me, the state fairgrounds, it's great to, to work with Virgil and uh, the Expo Commission to be on that commission. Um, but it, it's great to know that the, the governor's got a tremendous vision for that. Um, and it's exciting to see where the future takes us because that is a, that's our opportunity in the agricultural community to shine. That is our story to be told. It's our next generation that gets to exhibit. Um, and uh, it, it's a great story, and, and it's really exciting to see um, Governor Alain's leadership on that issue. Uh, any other pr priorities that you're going to be really focused on? The, uh, and, and you know, as I described, uh, 19 divisions at the Department of Agriculture, and that's anything from meat processing, quality assurance, to, uh, we are in uh, a lot of the, all the production, food production, uh, and, and just so many different areas, but you know, and we're heavily regulated. Let's be real. It's not somebody says it's not cows and plows. You know, it's it's a lot of different regulatory uh, agencies um, in the agricultural community, but also in the food food uh, food markets. So one of the initiatives that I have said, and 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 my message, you know, I, I had to relate it back to being a fire inspector uh, in a community. Um, the township I worked for was the 11th largest township in the state of Ohio. And, you know, there was a lot of business, there was a lot of retail, there's a lot of different sectors that supported the safety services that were provided. And, and my narrative and my message to, to our folks is, yes, we're regulatory, but this is a partnership. You know, we want to work with the Dairy Association. We want to work with our milk haulers, our dairies across the state. Safety's number one. We're not going to give up safety. We, we don't want that, er that narrative. The dairy industry, the pork industry, anybody, nobody wants that narrative that there is any kind of product in the agricultural community that is negative, but it is a partnership. So that's one of my huge goals is to make sure that we are working together with all of our agricultural community from the regulatory side of things. 
and you've got a wonderful room full of a cross-section of Ohio agriculturalists here. What do you want them to know before they leave today? Know that we're working hard for you. Uh, it's uh, it, truly, and I, I have to say that what an opportunity that Governor DeWine has given to me uh, to lead this agency. Um, but know that we're working for you. Uh, and uh, we've got a tremendous story here in the agricultural uh, community in Ohio to tell. And uh, our biggest thing, we just need to continue to tell it more and more. Tell the stories. Tell them to whoever will listen. Uh, because it's, a, it's, it's the strongest economy here and the largest economy here in Ohio. And it's a darn good story. And uh, this is group participation time now. We wanted to open this up for any questions anybody had out in the audience. Uh, I'm sure there's some out there for the new director. Uh, do we have any questions? We, we appreciate you being here, Director Baldridge, and we definitely from the pork industry appreciate the effort on the ADDL. You explain the new building, you explain the new technology, which is greatly needed. What's the strategy on filling those important staff positions to actually read the test? So great point. Um, and, uh, you know, from a standpoint, if we were the, you know, let's say if lab technicians and, and specialized folks in labs, if that was the only sector in Ohio that was struggling with how to fill positions, um, it'd be a different conversation. Um, whether it's the restaurant industry is, you know, they deal with these things. So it's, it's our economy, it's our jobs economy as a whole. So, you know, from a standpoint, we're, we're struggling as well. Um, we're concerned about that. We're evaluating some of these specialty positions um, and how we can, uh, you know, maybe change our layouts to make sure that we get these physicians, positions filled. So, but it's not an easy, it's not an easy fix. And it's not an easy fix even for that, that large pork farm that are producing, just that manual labor, that day-to-day -day operation. So uh, I, uh, I hear encouraging uh, numbers as far as uh, workforce issues that are improving. Uh, I am excited about that. I think the key component that, that I'm going to do, uh, I was speaking with the executive director um, that serves over all the, the universities who was a co colleague of mine in Ohio House, and I said, hey, why don't you have your, um, all your presidents come out and have a meeting out at the Department of Ag. We've got a nice conference room. And she said, I've only got a couple universities that are ag-based. I went, oh no, we've got every single one of your universities, there's a position at ag for one of those Susan grad one of those students that are getting ready to graduate. So that's one of my things that I'm going to do is just make sure that there's a narrative that people know and young folks know um, that there are positions at the Department of Ag that you can fill and it's, it's a very diverse uh, workforce. Congratulations, Director, on your new position. What are the opportunities that you see in the department that would uh, work towards the value added aspects of agriculture? We're seeing Intel and other industrial opportunities for development, but uh, we in the ag industry could also benefit from value added economic development and not have to worry about shipping all of our commodities somewhere else. Absolutely, uh, and obviously from a standpoint, you know, the, the value added, where we can use ethanol comes to mind. Uh, you know, we continue to push uh, and making sure that uh, I know we, we've worked with corn and wheat to make sure that there's a narrative that supports uh, ethanol uh, growth here in Ohio um, and, and any of those aspects that we can look at. Because if we can, if we can, we're going to raise it here at home and we can, we can use it here at home, uh, it's a win-win. Um, so all of those, uh, any of those conversations, even, even the aspects as we look at, as we look at the H2 Ohio program and so forth, trying to figure out you know, what is that business model in a fertilizer uh, plant uh, production facility, uh, local elevator, you know, what is the impact of H2 Ohio as we promote putting less phosphorus on the fields? You know, where can they transition into a more micronutrient? I was speaking with one of, uh, one of the uh, agribusiness folks at their reception, and they were talking about they have, they have kind of transitioned a little bit of their their facility and really focused on the micronutrients and how transitioning those specialized areas um, to, to make sure that uh, we're, we're doing everything that we can in the agricultural community. So I, I think, and, and who knows what that next issue is and who knows what that next 
um, topic that we can spin that to. Um, and, and I'm open for any and everything uh, moving ahead. So it's it's an exciting topic. Ohio, we're, we're set in just such a great location in, in our country um, to be part of anything that's at cutting edge, the next, next thing coming down the street. Got some other questions out there? Oh, yeah, already on it. Uh, obviously, my question is more, more than just an Ohio, <clears throat> Ohio issue, the national issue, but what, what are your feelings about China buying farmland in this country and where that goes? So I, I, I have a huge concern with that. Um, as a legislator, uh, 95 days ago, I had a couple meetings uh, actually in Scioto County, which was one of the districts that I covered from their central committee. Um, that group that wanted, they, uh, they kind of had a group that wanted to look at policy, and that was one of the topics that came up. And they took a vote, I think there's a central committee member, oh, Ed's not sitting here right now, but he was. Um, but he's on the central committee. But at a local level, this is a huge concern all over our state. Um, it's a huge concern for Governor DeWine. Uh, I, I, Got some emails right after I came into the job that says we need to work on this. Currently, we're working with two legislators, um, Angie King, who's up in Mercer County area and a couple other counties, and also Roy Kloppenstein, uh, who is a farmer himself, farms 2,500 acres up in Paulding County. So those two legislators are drafting, working with uh, Governor DeWine and the executive branch on uh, coming up with legislation. A number of states have passed some legislation to, to push back on this. Uh, this is very concerning. Um, so there is work being done. Uh, it's legislatively work being done uh, to protect, not, you know, it, protect Ohio, but there's other states doing the same type of legislation to push back uh, on that concern. Well, okay, let's have a round of applause for Director Brian Baldwin. <laughs>